Uh, Samuel? Yes, I think he's starting. Um, it's live and it's also the recording also have started, I think. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah, it has started, correct. Uh, so I think back end that streaming is happening, right? Uh, SRM logo and all? Yes, ma'am, it is happening and the recording is on. You can slowly start the session. So, okay, is it okay that because I, I see only five participants, uh, let me wait uh, up to seven and at seven o'clock I'll start. Uh, Dr. Joseph, is it okay if we start at seven? Yeah, yeah. And, and seven, seven, four is also okay, ma'am. No issues, we can uh, wait. Uh, we, Okay. Yeah, we, we should wait some minutes. We should wait ah. some minutes. Yes. Uh, the, uh, Samuel, uh, this link, will you just share it to me on my WhatsApp number, that uh, YouTube's?
Dr. Joseph, shall we start? Uh, okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, am I audible to you all? Uh, Radha ma'am, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible only. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, welcome, faculties, colleagues, uh, students, and other participants to this long awaited event on Nano Networking. So, before that, uh, we, I introduce you all to this uh, speaker. Let me just uh, have a kind of uh, ice breaking session. So, it all started like uh, during my engineering days. I was thinking, that if I had an hall ticket, which would say me that, hey, Manjula, you forgot me to carry with you, that would be very uh, good. Then during my PhD days, I was just thinking, if I had a router which had only one buffer, then I need not worry about buffer management techniques nor the queue management the or queuing theory. And then I thought if I had a device that could generate energy on its own, then I could have developed my own routing protocols that would least bother about the energy. Then next, I wish that I had abundant bandwidth so that I did not wor worry about bandwidth management issues. I wished that a sensor node or any such device could be, it can jump, it can dance, or it can crawl, or even penetrate into those regions uh, such as inside the human body so that uh, it can kill even the cancerous cells and save many people. I also wished that uh, some of the device, it could be a smart sensor that could smell the bad odor that emanates from uh, different places and report the issues. I wish that I had a sensor node or a smart technology that could give me sunlight where if my room is situated in an sun shadow region, I can protect my food grains and the food items. So there was an uh, ever ending craving for all such things, but then, I recently realized all these things are possible, but in a different way. And that is what we are going to study about uh, these nanotechnology. Uh, Dr. Joseph would be likely uh, bringing us to this um, topic areas, both on molecular communication, as well as your electromagnetic communication. So let me now introduce to Dr. Joseph. Uh, Dr. Joseph Jonet is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the director of Ultra Broadband Nanotechnology uh, Nano Networking Laboratory, and a member of the Institute for the Wireless Internet of Things and Smarts, which is a center name is what, at Northeastern University in Boston, MA. He received the Bachelor of Science in Telecommunication Engineering and the MSc in information and communication technologies from the University uh, Politecnica di Catalonia, Barcelona, Spain in 2008. He received the PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from Georgia Technology, uh, sorry, Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta, GA in 2013. From August 2013 and August 2019, he was a faculty with the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Buffalo the State University of New York. His current research interests are in the teraband, terahertz band communication networks, wireless nano biocommunication networks, and the internet of nano things. In these areas, he has co-authored more than 140 peer-reviewed scientific publications, one book, four US patents, which accumulate over 9,000 citations with an H index of 43 as on February 2021. He is serving as lead PI on multiple grants from the US federal agencies, including the National Science Foundation, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the Air Force Research Laboratory. He is also the co-editor in chief of Elsevier Nano Communications Nan uh, Networks Journal and serves in the steering committee of the ACM conference series on nanoscale computing and communications. He is a recipient of the National Foundation Career Award and of several other awards from ICP, ACM, and UB. 
He is a member of the ACM and a senior member of the IEEE. So I welcome Dr. Uh, Jonet to uh, this session. So just before that, uh, I would uh, let know the audience that the sequence of this event would be a talk for one hour session. So if you have any queries in between, you can enter your questions in the chat box. So if there are like uh, very critical questions which need to be given answered at, at that instant, I will interrupt Dr. Joseph. Otherwise, I will take these questions at the end of the sessions. So uh, now the stage is set to Dr. Uh, Joseph. Dr. Joseph, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manjula. And, and thank you once again for the invitation. I'm always happy to share you know, a vision and to share some work, particularly if I know that that can trigger some excellent minds to, to join the fun. So as you said, let's go for it. Uh, you know, I'll be talking, <laughs> I'll be sharing some thoughts and some knowledge and some research that we have done in, well, close to what, over 12 years. And as you said, if there are critical questions, you can stop me. If not, we'll have plenty of time at the end. So let's talk about nano networking in the terahertz band and beyond, and we'll have a vision from nanomaterials to macro systems. First of all, let's start. So, okay, yes, we all have heard about nanotechnologies, and, but what are nanotechnologies for us, uh, electrical and computer engineers or for communications people? Well, nanotechnologies are nothing but a new set of tools that allow us to control materials at the atomic and molecular scale. At this scale, you know, new nanomaterials and nanostructures show new properties that you cannot see at the microscopic or macroscopic scale. We're mostly talking about quantum driven phenomena. Fine, the idea is by leveraging the properties of these new materials and these new structures, we can create new types of devices with capabilities that we couldn't think of before. As an example of these applications, we can think of nanosensors and nano actuators. For example, we can utilize nanosensors to analyze biomarkers in the body. I'll explain that what's next. And we can also, for example, in terms of actuators, we could even control the behavior of the cells in your body if that's something that you wanted to do. And again, we'll talk plenty about that. Let's go one by one. Okay, let's just bring everyone to the same scale. Let's just take a snapshot, for example, to your blood, and let's assume that we have some cells. Excellent. Now, unfortunately, let's consider that there is, for example, a cancer cell. Just for everyone to follow, remember, what is cancer? Cancer is nothing but a disease that it all starts with a single cell going crazy. By going crazy, it means a single cell that stops communicating with other cells, a single cell that starts reproducing itself again like crazy. And the result is what in the past, the only thing we could see, it's a tumor, right? A, a millions of crazy cells in, in, a, in a spot. The reality is that, you know, the way in which we treat cancer has changed a lot. We don't need to wait for a big tumor to be visible. We can actually identify very small tumors thanks to new technologies. But even beyond that, if you look at what's the state of the art in cancer monitoring, the key idea is the following. Cancer cells, they do not communicate normally with other cells, but they do release some molecules in your bloodstream, which we call cancer biomarkers. And these cancer biomarkers are one of the elements that may trigger other cells to become cancerous. So the whole point is here. Every cancer starts from a single cell, a single cell that will start emitting these biomarkers. Wouldn't it be great if I were able to detect those biomarkers, would it be great if I had a small sensor that could detect those? And to give you a, an idea of the scale, we're talking that, for example, in this image, which is a rendering, of course, we're talking that you know this is a scale of 100 nanometers. So every single element that you see here, it's just maybe a few nanometers, tens of nanometers. So you need a sensor that should be reactive to these things. Okay, is this something that's already happening? Well, yes, if you go and look in the literature, you will find easily approximately 70,000 published papers in the broad field of nanobiosensing systems. How do those nanobiosensing systems look like? Well, traditionally, you have something very small like nanoparticles, and nanoparticles are usually tens or hundreds of nanometers of spheres, fine. Nanoparticles or nanopattern microsurfaces. So think of it as a flat surface, but with some 
nanometric rings on top, fine. And this has been developed for many years, and that is great. Those are really small. They can be used to detect those cancer biomarkers. The problem, however, is that to measure, to listen, to understand what the nanosensors are doing, you need an external optical excitation system and an external optical measurement system. To give you an idea, your sensors are very small and they can sense something very small, but to measure what the sensors are, those sensors cannot communicate. Those sensors are nothing but an inactive piece of material, right? So you need to interrogate them and you need to measure back. You need to do kind of a radar with a nanoscale element. And that type of radar, for that type of radar today, you need these very big platforms that they make sense in a laboratory, but they don't make sense in the majority of facilities. And for sure, they don't make sense on you. Fine. But remember, we do have a way to sense those very small things. Fine. Sensing is great, but I think that even more exciting is to control, right? Remember from the early days of sensor networks, we had wireless sensor and actuator networks. Sensing is great. How about controlling? Well, let me show another application. You understand that, you know, uh, the nervous system in our body, it's nothing but a network of neurons. Neurons, again, in this fancy rendering, are nothing but uh, a, a specific type of cell that have a, a head of a, or a nucleus with a given size, usually tens of micrometers, and then they have a long tail, and the long tail connects to another neuron. What is really interesting is that the majority of neurodegenerative diseases, think of Parkinson's, think of Alzheimer's, think of any other neurodegenerative disease, it all starts with a communication problem between neurons. And again, what are we? Well, we're communications and networking people. So we think, right, we should be able to fix a networking problem, even if that problem happens to be in a network inside your body. Fine, I'm talking about real neurons, not artificial neural networks that some people do for, for example, machine learning. No, I'm talking about the neurons in your brain, the neurons in your nervous system. Fine. It's interesting. Is, is there a way in which, in which, for example, I can trigger a neuron to properly send signals when it's supposed to, or I can stop a neuron from triggering signals when it's not supposed to? Again, think of neurodegenerative diseases in the brain, like Alzheimer's, that something is not processing what it's supposed to process or think that neurodegenerative diseases in the body, for example, Parkinson's, shaking, that's processing too much electrical signals in your neuron. Can I interact with neurons? Well, how people are interacting with neurons? Well, there is this whole field of brain-machine interfaces. And usually, when, when you think of a brain-machine interface, you think of someone wearing this helmet with tons of wires coming out of it, and sure, that is great to write papers and that is great for some demonstrations, but I don't really think that that's the future of how men and machines interact. I think that you know we, we can do much better. And the reality is that in addition to the electrical interfaces that people have been developing, we also have optical interfaces. In other words, we are all very bright people, no doubt about that. But our neurons are not sensitive to light and our neurons are not shiny. So, okay, so how can we wirelessly interface with, with neurons? Well, our neurons will not react to 2.4 gigahertz. The only thing that we can do is that around 15 years ago, it was shown that if you add some specific proteins to your neurons, think of it as taking a, you know, a drug. If you not add that drug to your neurons, your neurons will become sensitive to blue light. Since then, people have been working on ways of utilizing light, lasers, blue light mostly, to control neuronal activity. And that is great. And once again, the physics are on our side. But uh, what people are doing today, for example, to inject light in someone's brain, is to drill a hole in the skull and inject an optical fiber. And honestly, I don't think that's the future of brain machine <clears throat> interfaces either. Couldn't we do something better? Well, let's think. Huh? It would be great if I could make a very small device. We call them a nano machine. You can think of it as a sensor and actuator that also has some computational power, some way to have energy, some memory. It would be great if I could create those nano machines embed them in your body. And instead of me having to come from the outside and push and collect information with big devices, it would be great if this nanomachine could report to me. 
The same idea as wireless sensor networks 20 years ago, right? In which instead of you having to go and check the value of something, you have a, a net, uh, network of sensors that they talk to each other eventually to a sync. The same idea, but just a million times smaller. And for example, in your body or in any other ways, not all the applications of nano are in the body as we will see later. Fine. So imagine that you could make those devices. Imagine that they could communicate. And of course, it would be great that they can communicate to you, but it's also great if you can communicate to them. Okay, can we make those nano machines? Is there a practical way to do that? Well, there have been many ideas on how you could do that since you know some of the very early uh, ideas in this field. Uh, full disclaimer, right? I mean, I, I started this work when I was a PhD student with Professor Ian Achildes at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. And he's you know someone that I would like to describe as, as a real visionary. He's usually 10 years ahead of the rest of the community. And when you're his PhD student, you have the opportunity to be working on topics that many people will think are crazy. Still today, some people think are crazy, but it's not crazy, it's just the future. So in this paper back in 2011, and this is actually a refined version of summer read results from 2008, we showed how we could create those nano machines. Look at this figure. We have on the X axis, we have the size of the elements and we're going from millimeters to micrometers to nanometers, fine. The bottom part of the figure refers to man-made devices, whereas the upper part refers to what nature has already done for us. For example, when we're in the millimeter scale, right? On the artificial side, we talk about sensors, microsensors, microelectronics, fine. If we go to the micrometric size, we talk about nanosensors. And you said, oh, but nanosensors, I thought it would be nanometer. And you're saying that nanosensors are micrometer. Well, the components of a nanosensor might be nanometers because they are based on nanoelectronics. They are based on nanophotonics. They are based on carbon nanotubes, graphene nanoribbons, new type of stuff. But when you put everything together, the size is going to be a few microns. Fine. What happens in the nature side? Well, in the nature side, for example, at millimetric scale, we have insects, right? If we keep going small, then we'll start to distinguish, for example, the cells in your body, which are a few tens of micrometers, for example, for a red blood cell. We'll start talking about bacteria, right? Again, less than a few micrometers. And of course, both cells, bacteria, at the end of the day, they are also machines that have different components like DNA, organelles, mitochondria. And if you go going small, well, at the end of the day, you find the molecules, which are just a few nanometers. The reality is that there are different ways to go to nanomachines. You can try to make things smaller in the top-down approach, or you can put nano things together in the bottom-up approach. You can go in an artificial way, synthetic, you know, nanomaterial-based approach. You can leverage biology. My personal take, some people think that biology is the best thing you can do. And to that, let me just say one thing. I mean, I can run, but my car can run much faster. I can talk, but my computer can talk much faster, right? So I do not believe that the ultimate bounds of performance are given by nature. I actually do strongly believe in, in which, uh, into a hybrid approach that leverages the both. But okay, let's don't get too philosophical just yet. Okay, how would those nano machines look like in one way or the other? Well, as we were saying, if we come from the top-down approach, or not top-down approach, but if we come in a man-made approach, right? If we would like to make a nano machine that looks like something we can build in a you know nano fabrication facility, we know that that machine would have to need what? It would need some processor and some memory. It would need some small battery. It would need, of course, a, a way to collect energy or to generate energy. Uh, I mean, to generate power on board. And of course, we, we want to do this for sensing and actuation. So we need nanosensor and actuations, and we want this thing to be able to communicate. Fine. This device would have to be a few, again, uh, micrometers, a few cubic micrometers. And as you will see today, we, we are actually you know, looking into ways to do that. Fine. Of course, as I said, when you go to that scale, there is the natural approach, which is the idea that you can take advantage of what nature has already done for you. And for example, if you look uh, at a cell, right? So the cell will have, for example, the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the ones in charge of producing energy for your cells by combining the oxygen and the nutrients that you absorb from blood. You have chemical receptors. Those are sensors. 
you have a, a, a flagellum, for example, that will allow you to move around. That's an actuator. You have the DNA. The DNA, as we will see later today, it's the source code of your cell. So at the end of the day, cells and processors look, you know, cells and nanomachines look very much together and we could make all these mappings. And yes, those are the two approaches we think today it's, you know, we could generate nanomachines. Fine, of course, if we're talking about artificial devices, we will talk about some type of communication. If we're talking about living devices, we'll talk about a different type of communication. And for example, how do the living devices in your body or outside the body communicate? Well, they communicate not by exchanging electromagnetic signals. They communicate by exchanging molecules. So usually when you enter the field of nano networking, you will see that there are mostly two tracks. One track related to electromagnetics and talking about nano devices from the nanomaterial perspective and another track that comes from the, bio from the biology in which you're going to uh, be dealing with molecular communications. And there are many ways for molecular communication to, to happen, right? We can talk about diffusion, arbection, walk away different technologies to communicate machines, biological machines at the nanoscale. And so far, I would say half of the community into nano networking has been focused on to first understanding biology. And that's usually, I mean, that sometimes is hard for an EC electrical and computer engineer, but that's, uh, I mean, in collaboration with biologists. The second part is on to controlling biology and creating machines which are biological, but have the properties you want. And that can be done through synthetic biology. Fine, that's one part and that's very, side, very important side of the work. The other part of the work is like, well, uh, biology is great, but can, can we do something which is you know, actually not biological? Can I do a machine that cannot die? Can I do a machine that looks more like what I'm used to, but has all these properties that you're mentioning of being super small, super sensitive, being able to communicate, being able to harvest power. That's the second track. And that's what we call the nano electromagnetic communication track in which it, everything, everything starts with being able to develop very small antennas and very small radios at the end of the day. How do we do that? Well, we do that by leveraging new materials. And for example, some of you may have heard about you know, graphene and other two dimensional materials. Some of you may have heard about metamaterials, right? Which are man-made artificial materials that you obtain by combining different types of elements, usually a combination of metals and dielectrics. And of course, you can put all these things together and also throw in some of the traditional semiconductors and try to do things. The key property in nanoelectromagnetic communication is that we are going to leverage a new type of physics, the physics enabled by plasma wave, and in particular, surface plasma polarity wave that we will explain later on. The result is when you go with these materials and you go with this physics, you end up working at very high frequencies. So you will have to forget about the 2.4 gigahertz that you love, the five gigahertz. You will have to even forget about millimeter wave. You need to go beyond. You need to start talking about terahertz band. So hundreds of gigahertz to a few terahertz or even optical, whether it's infrared, visible, and to some extent, ultraviolet. Fine. So what has my lab been doing for the last 10 years? Well, we actually have been working on trying to establish the foundations of nano communication networks on the second path at terahertz and optical frequencies, but always with one thing in mind, which is that the ultimate goal is a hybrid, as you will see. How do we establish the foundations of something? Well, you start at the bottom. And what's the first thing that you need to do? Well, you need to be able to have the radios, the antennas that can fit into a device that is just a few micrometers in size. So we first today will be showing some of the results in terms of materials, devices, and test beds. After that, we'll need to understand, okay, that's, those are the devices, but do the signals really propagate well in the body, for example, or again, outside the body? You'll see how we move outside the body in 10 slides. Well, we need to understand electromagnetic propagation. We need a channel model at the end of the day, and we need to understand the interactions with the body. Fine. Only when we know what the physics of the devices can support and what the physics of the channel can do, only when we do that, it's when we, it makes sense to start talking about the communications and signal processing. What is the best type of signal that I should transmit? 
What is going to happen to the poor signals? How am I going to protect them from errors, from interference, from noise? How am I going to get nano machines synchronized? Fine. Once you understand how to make one link between one transmitting nano machine and one receiving nano machine, it makes sense that you build a network. And that's the next step. And the good news is that after, again, since 2009, I started my PhD till today, so 12 years. In 12 years, many things have changed. And the good news is that today we do have devices, we do understand the channel, and we actually know the physical layer quite well. So it's great if more people on, with a networking background enter the field. And of course, we need, to do, we need to do all this within a legal framework, right? So policy and regulation, and ideally, we would all have to agree. So standardization. All these are layers when that, as a research group, we are targeting or whether individually or in collaboration to eventually explain or make this field a reality. What is our vision for some of these applications? Well, we said today, for example, when it comes to cancer monitoring, you have the nanoparticles in the body, but then you need something big outside the body. Well, for the last five years, we have been working with the support of the National Science Foundation, but as well industry partners like Intel at Garwood Medical, as well as one of the largest cancer research uh, institutes in New York on the development of wearable devices that can be utilized in conjunction with the intrabody devices, usually implanted, but they could also be circulating in the blood with the intrabody devices. So we can monitor biomarkers without the need of taking a blood sample or without the need of having to go to a lab. So having a wearable device that can interrogate, that can communicate with just tiny devices, again, few micrometers devices, which are under your skin, but deep enough to have exposure to the bloodstream. That's one of the type of works that, yes, we're working on. And again, it sounds crazy, but well, it is what it is. It's not crazy. It's just a little bit ahead. The other application, it's once again in the field of brain machine interfaces. We don't want to drill a, a hole in anyone's skull. Uh, we know that our devices, Dr. Joseph, the ones you will I see next. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, there are two queries. One question is from uh, Pradeep Kumar Barik. Are the nano power generators uh, do gen uh, energy harvesting? I Means he's expecting, do they do harvesting process? Then Very good. Yes. How much mm -hmm. amount of energy the battery can store as they are nano? That means the size is nano. So which application uh, are they suitable for? Very good question. Um, and it's good that you ask it because no, I don't have those slides with me today, but yes. So one thing, indeed, one of the key blocks besides communication is to be, have, to be able to have energy to power everything. And yes, we do have a nano, I mean, energy harvesting nano systems. So nano systems that harvest energy. We have several, several works from back 2012 uh, in which we actually, it's an IEEE transactions and nanotechnology paper in which we show that yes, you can uh, harvest different types of energies. There are mostly two groups of people harvesting energy. People who are trying to harvest electromagnetic energy. And when you go to this very small size, the only energy that you can physically harvest from the electromagnetic spectrum, as you will see, are very high frequencies. So photovoltaics, but inside the body, photovoltaics don't make any sense. But if you use these devices, for example, for architectural control, or even to paint the walls in your home to detect the presence of different chemicals, in that case, you could use photovoltaics. But the other track, which is very relevant, uh, is the harvesting of vibrations. So mechanical energy harvesting that you achieve through piezoelectronic devices. Devices that piezo, piezoelectronic means that they convert mechanical into electrical energy. What do you do with that energy? And you'll say, first of all, which vibrations? Well, even in your heart, the first thing you have, it's a heart beating. That's creating vibration at a very well-defined rate. Fine, so we can not harvest the vibration, even the motion of your blood. From the moment you have blood pressure that you are not dead, you can harvest that, good. The second part of your question is, and where do I put this energy? Well, that's the problem, that we do have batteries. And again, think in the following way, how has the technology for batteries improved in the last years? Well, it has improved because we have brought in new materials and new structures by leveraging nanotechnology. You put many of those together, you have a big battery for your car. But if you go to the foundations, you can create batteries, nano batteries, which are, again, few cubic micrometers and could harvest some energy. 
To give you an order of magnitude, we are talking about batteries that may be able to store a few microjoules or, or less picojoules, but you are harvesting all the time. So the key idea here is more than thinking of you harvesting energy and then operating for a while, you need to find the sweet spot in which you can be harvesting all the time. Again, your heart is beeping, is beating, so you're fine. So you should be harvesting all the time and we know it's not too much, but then you need to design your communication system that again, should not spend more than what you can harvest because your battery is going to be very small. Does this answer the question, I hope? Yes, uh, Doctor, he also would like to know uh, like what are the potential application areas, uh, which applications they are suitable for. I think that has already been covered with respect to the diagram which is already showed here. Yeah, we have these bio-related applications and later on we'll talk about non-bio-related applications. We'll get there. <laughs> we have 50 slides ahead still, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then there's an, another question from Gitanjali. Earlier she had raised her hand, but now she has put up a question here. As it is a nano machine, if they are electronic devices, they follow Moore's law or what? She would like to know because we are telling that these are electronic devices. Are they going to follow the Moore's law? <laughs> That's a very good question uh, again. And the idea is the following. If we are to follow Moore's law, Moore's law we're going to have a problem. Uh, and that's why instead of thinking of a silicon-based approach or a traditional 3-5 semiconductor approach, when I'll show you some of the devices in the next few slides, you'll see that we come with something very different. Of course, something that technologically it's, it's, it's challenging, but physically it's possible. And when we do all this research, we always do the same. When, when someone tells, oh, is this going to happen? Is this, is this a limitation? You always need to ask the same. Is it a limitation because of physics? And unfortunately, if it's the only laws that we cannot change are the laws of physics, or is it a limitation because of the technology? And what we're going to show you today, actually, we're going to show you real devices. Just let me get there. Uh, they, they satisfy the laws of physics. Uh, they are just technologically challenged, but we build them, which means that eventually it could be mass produced. But that's also a very good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, can I, uh, would you like to take one more question? Sure. Yeah, fine. And there's another request for the students or uh, those who are queries. Uh, better if you want it to be asked in between, please put it in the chat box. Otherwise, if you want to ask personally, at the end, I will take it, uh, take the questions. So there's one question from Debussy Basu. Uh, his question is, while working in very high frequency, okay, if the wavelength becomes comparable with the human body cell size, so in the bracket, he has given that cancer affected cell. Is there any chance that the structural configuration of the cell can be changed due to interacting with the wave? Are we these actually are receiving yeah. the real uh, time status of these body tissues? Yeah, this is another, another excellent question that again, we'll have answered in the next few slides. Uh, just a disclosure, uh, as wireless communication people, we're afraid sometimes of the high frequencies. But it's interesting because if we go and think how, for example, a biomedical facility or you know, bio studies or a medical facility, how they do everything, at the end of the day, they rely on imaging, usually optical imaging. Remember, optics is very high frequencies, wavelength of hundreds of nanometers, and they do use it for interaction. So from a wireless community, we're always afraid. From the societal perspective, Electromagnetic signals are dangerous. But then you go to the biomedical community, they say, no, we're using light for everything. We use light for microscopy. We use light for surgery. We use light for everything. But I'll answer some of these questions. I have a slides for that. Let me get to those. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Perfect. So let's continue. And again, feel free to stop me anytime. Yes. So we're saying, so how do we go from those exciting applications that we mentioned at the beginning, but that were traditionally limited by you know, the lack of communication between inside the body and outside the body. So we said we can do that with wearable devices and when we're trying talking about sensing, but we are also talk about how we can leverage different technologies to again, create a wireless interface and not just to sense, but also to control, particularly for example, to control neurons in which once again, you will have some of these nano machines inside your body and you may think, oh, guy, this is crazy. Well, I can just tell you that, you know, probably you all know what DARPA is, right? DARPA, it's 
used to be ARPA. They are the fathers of the internet back in the 60s, right? So many years ago, well, a few years ago, DARPA had their own solicitation asking for neuro nanotechnology. And they were exactly asking for nano devices that could be effectively injected to the brain. And injected doesn't mean drilling anything. It means actually, remember, there is something connected to your brain, which are, is your nasal cavity. So could you sniff those nano machines, have them deployed, and then have an interface for them to communicate in and out? Uh, for example, to enhance the human brain capabilities. So, well, we have some ideas on how we could do that as a combination of electromagnetics for the control of neurons, but also ultrasounds, as again, we know from, you know, pretty much every type of test that you can do in the body, which can leverage ultrasound technology, acoustic wave to measure. Fine. So we think that we have ways to close that, but I know this all sounds like very science fiction-y. Let, let's talk about some of these devices with more in detail. First of all, uh, okay, actually, let me say that, yes, there are applications which are non-bio. And for example, there are many places where you can benefit from having a small radio. For example, right, uh, there are, think of how your computer has, architecture has evolved in the last several years, right? We went from having a computer with a single core processor to a dual core processor to a quad core, octa core. Right now, people are working on the research of a thousand cores on a chip. How do you interconnect a thousand cores, a thousand processing cores inside one chip? Well, you can have a shared bus, but if you, network, if you remember from your networking class, a shared bus between thousands of users is not an effective way to share a medium. That's why several groups, not necessarily us, but actually would say many groups in Europe are working on inter, I mean, wireless networks on chip that for sure, in that case, you need very small antennas. And of course, those could be nano antennas and nano radios that can benefit from that. Fine. Just going beyond this, let's talk about some of the devices. So first thing, right? If I need to make a small antenna, I know that this is a small antenna. You know, if you remember from your applied electromagnetics class or your antenna design class, you know that the smaller the antenna, the higher the frequency it will it resonate. In other words, if you need to make a resonant antenna for a very high frequency, you will have to make the antenna half of the wavelength of that frequency. And the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. Again, small antennas, high frequencies or high frequencies, a small antenna. You can see, think it one way or the other. Let's assume for a second that we follow the exact same theory as in traditional antennas. Uh, well, if I make my antenna, let's say one micrometer long, just one micrometer long dipole antenna, the typical ones that we teach in textbooks when we teach applied electromagnetics, I know that my resonant frequency would be somewhere around 150 terahertz. Where is that? Okay, let's look at the spectrum, right? This is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. And many times when we teach electromagnetics, we focus a lot on the radio and microwave, or particularly when we teach antennas, we always focus on the radio wave, the microwave, which means hundreds of megahertz, a few gigahertz, but remember, electromagnetic radiation at the end of the day, yes, you can understand it as waves and deal on this side of the spectrum, or you can understand it as particles, photons, and go to the higher frequencies. But the truth is that electromagnetic radiation is electromagnetic radiation. And if you wanted to make an antenna for this side of the spectrum, like infrared and visible, you would just have to make your antenna very small. And that's what it's telling us. If we make a dipole antenna, that it's only one micrometer long, that dipole antenna will operate around 150 terahertz, which this is between, you know, the near infrared and visible. Is it that simple to make a very small antenna? Well, let's think. When we teach antennas in a class, usually we teach those for radio wave and microwave. And I'm quite confident that not many of you have come across papers talking about optical nano antennas or antennas for light. But the reality is that today we can do so. Why did, why did it take so long to have antennas for light? Well, when you make an antenna for optical signals, we're saying that the largest dimension of your antenna is going to be one micrometer, for example, which means that the gap, the feeding gap, or any other feature size of your antenna, it's probably to be much smaller. In the past, when all the antenna theory was developed, when all the first wireless systems came out, we were not able to build antennas with that resolutions just because of the tools. 
But today, with the tools we have, we can build antennas that allow us to manipulate light in the same way that you can manipulate radio frequencies, radio wave, microwave, millimeter wave, uh, but now, you know, just with much, much smaller structures. Of course, it's not an immediate translation because when we teach antennas, we say, okay, our antenna is based on a metal and you, you, we usually model those antennas as perfect electric conductors. But the reality is that when you go to optical frequencies, even metals do not have an ideal conductivity. They have a complex valued conductivity that allows the propagation of surface waves. Those surface waves change the properties of the antenna, not only its efficiency, but also its resonant frequency. The surface wave, we call them surface plasmon polariton waves, and you need to take them into account when designing those antennas. The good news, however, is that again, today we have the tools to make antennas which are literally less than a micrometer if you want. And the result is because of the surface plasma polariton wave actually is that if you want to make an antenna for light, it's going to be even smaller, but that's okay. That's just some idea. The bottom line is picture on the left, how things look when you make a simulation with your CST, HFSS or console, picture on the right, a built and measured nano antenna, which happens to be half a micrometer. So we can do that. Just keep that in mind. Fine. We, we can do those type of antennas. The antenna is great, but someone needs to put signals into the antenna, right? An antenna is a passive element. An antenna does not create signal. An antenna converts an electrical current into an electromagnetic signal or the other way around, an electromagnetic signal into an electrical current. Fine. How can we excite an antenna? Well, if we are dealing with an antenna for light, we need something that can excite things at optical frequencies. So the first idea is that maybe we want to use an, a very small laser. And once again, can we make very small lasers? Well, yes, today we can make lasers, which are again, just a few micrometers or even less. And for example, in this picture, what we show here in the middle, it's what is known as a micro cavity or a micro ring uh, laser. These are lasers that we design and we build in collaboration with Professor Liang Feng. And not only we show that these lasers can be, can actually work, even if they are micrometric, but we also show that these lasers can be modulated, which means that we can add zeros and ones. So once again, I'm not talking that you can go on Amazon or your favorite online store and buy nano machines. But what I'm showing is that physics are on our side. Physics enable us to do these devices. It's technologically challenging, but technology is something that we can improve. Physics, it's something that we cannot change. At most, we can come up with new physics that explore other things, but we don't need to do that. Physics are on our side. We can make these devices. Again, the figure on the right, it's a measured figure. Fine. We can make the antennas. We can make the radios. And of course, the power might not be much. Maybe we don't even have much power. So we need to, in, to explore different things. Like for example, right? Can we make an array of these devices so I can emit more power or even more than that? Many of you, you know, you will say, oh, the signals in the body may not propagate well, or even the signals, you know, outside your body may not propagate well. So we need to focus the signals. And I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with the ideas of beamforming, right? And antenna arrays, smart antennas. Well, can we make beamforming antenna arrays, but in, at optical frequencies and utilizing instead these very small antennas? Well, we have done so, again, in different ways. Uh, we have done this both by lining up lasers or by lining up antennas and then showing uh, how we can control light at the nanoscale in the same way that we can control radio wave and microwave at the large scale. Fine, so the devices are helping us. But another question, will these signals go well through the body? Well, first news, we are not transparent. So from the moment we're not transparent, it means that light does not necessarily go through us. Fine. Many people, especially if we come from the body area networks perspective, and usually we look at the radio wave and microwave frequencies, we know that the higher the frequency, things get uglier. And that's why people say, no, no, the lower the frequency, the better. But then you have the medical community who is already using optical signals. And, and you say, what am I missing here? Well, it all depends on what are you trying to do with your signals? And once again, your body should not be understood 
as a body should not be understood as a collection of tissues, should be understood in the same way as your wavelength understand your body. And if your wavelength is going to be hundreds of nanometers, that's the wavelength of light, you need to look at your body at the hundreds of nanometer scale. And this relates with the question that uh, we had before from, from the audience. And yes, you need to look and study the interaction of electromagnetic radiation one cell at a time. And we have done plenty of work on that, both theoretical and experimental, showing that indeed we are not transparent and we know that the signals will not necessarily propagate deep. But when we're talking about cells, you just need to scale yourself, right? Will you be able to achieve centimeter propagation from a device which is hundreds of nanometers dealing with a wavelength of hundreds of nanometers? Well, centimeter propagation is six orders of magnitude more or five order of magnitude more. No, you're not going to achieve five order of magnitudes more in the same way that your Wi-Fi cannot communicate over tens of kilometers, right? But not only that, if you have your radiation inside your body, we always think, oh, there is going to be absorption by the different molecules. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. There is going to be the signal going all over the place. But what's really interesting is that actually there are, just because of the electromagnetic properties of some of your components or the building components of your cells, sometimes we are able to enhance the signal. And we had this paper a couple of years ago, which, you know, we were one year late. There was a nature paper, another group did us before us, in which they were experimentally showing how red blood cells, for example, in your bloodstream, were acting as lenses. What is a lens? A lens is a device that focuses light. So we were able to show that, I mean, someone was able, not us, someone was able to show experimentally that red blood cells can focus light. We actually developed the theory for that, but we were late on the experiment. We were able to then show that neurons are also able to focus light. And therefore, we should not think of the channel just as something that it's bad. It all comes at the interaction at the nanoscale. Plenty of words. But again, the physics are not necessarily against us. We just need to know how to leverage them. Fine. All these are devices, right? And, and physics that we explain. And what I'm trying to say is that in the last 10 years, many things have changed. And some of those crazy applications that I showed you at the beginning or just a few slides ago today are possible. In particular, in the next following slides, I'm going to show you how we experimentally demonstrated brain machine interfaces based on light. And we actually went crazy, of course, it's our group. And we started first by doing what everyone, or you know, what people have learned to do in the, in the last 10 years, which is to use light to control the interactions between cells. But then we're going to go to something even crazier, which is optogenomics, which is show you how we can use light to reprogram your cells. I don't want to get people lost into biology, so I'm not going to say too many things, but just think in the following way. It was around 15 years ago, that someone out from California, I mean, I don't remember, I mean, Stanford or Berkeley, one of the two, or UCLA, showed that, again, if you give this drug, you take this drug or, you know, you give this protein to your neurons, then you will be able to control their behavior. What did they show? Well, they showed that if you have living neurons, you add this thing called a channel rhodopsin into your neurons, this CHR2. So you have your neurons, you are, you add them, you transfect them with this channel rhodopsin, then what happens is the following. If you shine blue light onto your neurons, the neurons will open the gates for the calcium ions to flow. Calcium ions are how neurons communicate. So neurons in your body communicate by exchanging electrochemical signals, chemical signals that have electrical charge. Those are generally calcium ions. And what the whole field of optogenetics, which was created 15 years ago, what the whole field is, it's showing that if you add this channel rhodopsin to your neurons and then you shine blue light, you can open the gates for these calcium ions to flow. But if you do not shine blue light, those calcium ion gates are closed. This was done, this was done long time ago. So what was the novelty from our side? Well, the first thing is that when you build a lab, you need to build your credibility. So the first thing is that you need to show that you're able to reproduce what, what the other groups have done. That's the first thing. We want to show that we know how to control neurons through optogenetics, uh, but we wanted to add our spin. 
So we wanted to do this not for all the neurons. We wanted to do this one neuron at a time because the future is not that you blast the entire brain. The future is that you control one neuron at a time, the, those neurons that start to act crazily. So we wanted to show that we can do this at the micrometric scale. So we built a nano device in which this case, we the light was, think of this as a laser that does not emit light everywhere, a laser that is blacked out and in which we make two tiny openings. One is just five by five micrometers, the other is 20 by 20 micrometers. So when we power on this laser, light only comes to these tiny apertures. I mentioned before that a, a neuron, it's just a few tens of micrometers, like 20 micrometers in size. So these spots were, were good enough to shine maybe one or a few neurons. Fine, of course, we had to put this. I mean, look, we're used to deal with computers. Computers do not die. The worst case is that your battery dies and then you charge it. When we deal with neurons, well, neurons die if you don't feed them, if you don't provide them oxygen. So you need to keep them in the right solutions. And if you put a laser in a, you know, liquid full of neurons, well, that laser is going to blow up, right? So that you cannot do that. So we had to build a little bit of an artifact to be able to have neurons on a Petri dish, a nano laser close to it, and then measure what happens. We were able to do that. And we were able indeed to see that, you know, we were able, for example, this is a micrograph, a microscope image, right? In which what we did was to shine uh, some blue light using our device in the two spots that we mentioned. And then we could see through fluorescence that we added something else to the neurons. We added something that if there are calcium ions flowing, there is another protein that reacts and I can observe that protein through fluorescence. Part. That's why we see red things here. So I shine with blue light and I look what happens on the red light. And what could see is that indeed we can trigger only the neurons that we want to. We don't need to trigger, think of this as a field of neurons. We were able to trigger just the neurons we wanted. Fine. And that's okay. You know, that's, that's just a refinement of what people have done in the past, which is to use light to control calcium ions in neurons. They did it over big areas. We did it, you know, one neuron at a time. But our collaborators, again, you don't do this work all on your own. You don't become a biologist overnight. At the end of the day, you need to become good at something and then find someone who is equally good at something you don't know. And then you find a common language and start talking. So, you know, we did that with uh, Professor Stachowiak at the University at Buffalo, where I spent six years before moving to Northeastern. And well, he was like, look, I noticed that my cells, after we do this, they, they suffer and they eventually die very quickly. So I have a feeling that this blue light is messing up with many other things in the cell, as some of you were asking before. Well, wh what was going on with this blue light? He said, look, let's do another experiment. Let's do the same with the blue light thingy, but let's go and see, let's monitor some specific genes in the cell. Remember, your cell at the end of the day is a nano machine that has many things. One thing it's a processor. Your processor is based on DNA. Your DNA is the source code. Remember, every cell in your body has the same DNA, but different cells read different chunks of the DNA. Different cells run different functions. Fine. So he wanted to see if we were triggering any function in the DNA that would lead to the cells to suffer and eventually die. So we said, let's monitor two genes. One is the CFOS, which is a gene that it gets annoyed very easily and very quickly. It's an early response gene. The other is FGFR1 that we'll talk a little bit about more this gene later. And we're going to do the same. We're going to go shine the blue light and now see if there are, besides the calcium ions going around, let's go and see if we trigger any other thing in the neurons. And what we showed is that indeed, in this figure, it's a little bit complicated, but just think in the following way. On here, you see, if we don't shine light, we don't see any red dots. If we shine light, we see red dots when? When we have added the channel rhodopsin, fine. But now these red dots do not indicate calcium. These red dots now indicate CFOS. And we can see that indeed when we shine light, we are triggering this CFOS gene. It's a gene, it's a chunk of your DNA to, to, to trigger itself, to express itself, fine. And we know that the problem is the channel rhodopsin because we see that if we don't put channel rhodopsin that we use any other protein, actually CFOS, it's just lightly expressed. So nothing is going on. So blue light triggers something, but the, the major problem is not that blue light triggers CFOS. 
The main problem is that the channel rhodopsin triggers CFOS. And we saw that this was true for this type of gene, but was also true for FGS, FGFR1, which is another gene. So what does this mean? Well, this meant that, why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because many things, right? We're showing that this blue light and this channel rhodopsin is creating some mess. And yes, it's great that I can treat your Parkinson or your Alzheimer. It's not great that I kill you because of that. So what can we do? Um, well, can, can we maybe do better? Can, can we actually, can we come up with a way that instead of going with what everyone is doing, the channel rhodopsin, I can go and trigger different genes and only the genes I want? Well, could we do that? Of course, all wirelessly. Well, that's what we want to do. And that's what we have been working in, again in collaboration with Professor Stachowiak. And that's what we show. Why is this important? Well, I'm telling, we just found a way that we can use light to control genes. We can use light to control not just the big chunks of your neuron, but actually to reprogram your neurons. So we found a way that we can reprogram, we can trigger which part of your DNA is red. In other words, we have found a way to reprogram your genome, or at least a principle of how that could be done. Of course, we wrote this paper, and if you are into it, you can actually read it. I think it's a good paper that focuses on bridging how biological networks and electronical systems can be co-designed and drawn to be, I mean, be able to one control the other. Of course, we did this with the most honest intention, which is, you know, being able to restore some neurodegenerate, neurodegenerate uh, functions of, of our brains. Of course, some people took this in the wrong way and suddenly there are papers in the news saying that we're hacking the genome. We're not hacking anyone, of course. You can take the technology and do something else, but we are trying to do it in a good way. But let me go. So what is the question? What, what are the questions? Okay, we saw that light with some proteins can trigger genes. But the questions are, can I go and pick up only the genes that I care? I don't want to create a mess in my neuron. I don't want just to type typing source code and good luck. No, I want to go and tailor functions in your source code, fine. And if so, how, which gene should I go? So I need, to, I need to learn how to target only one gene at a time, and then I need to decide which gene to target. For the first question, again, great news, People in another context have been looking into other light controlled uh, switches. And for example, we can move away from this channel rhodopsin that creates all this stress to the cell. We can move from that and adopt another, uh, you know, think of it as another protein, another drug, which works in a very interesting way. This is what we call the FIB and PIF6. You think of them as a couple of, of proteins that when we shine, light at 650 nanometer, that's kind of a yellowish, almost red, but no, that's, yeah, that's yellowish, between yellow and red. When you shine that light, these two proteins come together, but if then you shine light, which is really red, 750 nanometers, those two proteins go apart. So the idea is the following. I have, I can add some proteins that I can not only bring together, I can also break apart. And what's even more interesting, if I add something to the tail of these proteins, then I can force this thing to go together when I shine with light, or I can force these things to break apart when I shine the other color light. So two colors, open, close, and you connect something to the switch, so you can open and close what you pick to close. Okay, what do we want to open and close? Well, then and again, when our collaborator, Professor Stachowiak enters the game, and he says, look, I've been studying all my life this specific gene, the fibroblast growth factor receptor 1, FGFR1, which is a gene that plays a key role into the development of cells. In other words, this is a, it's a gene that, remember, at the end of the day, everything starts from a stem cell, right? And this stem cell starts dividing, and then different cells will start adopting different functions. The adoption of the different factions is controlled by FGFR1. So if we can control FGFR1, we can control the development of cells and we can you know, recover something that was not properly developed or something that was developed, but then became lost. This is full biology. I will not jump into it, but again, when someone whom I collaborate and I trust tells me this, I said, okay, so let's try to couple this light control switch with these genes and let's see what happens. 
And that's exactly what we did in our most recent optogenomic. We are not using light to just control the neurons. We're using light to reprogram their genome in this optogenomic experiment. We did very similar mechanisms as before, but we removed the channel rhodopsin. We put this FIB-BP6 combo, and instead of using blue light, we're using these two shades of red to see if we can control neurons. And what we were able to see on this figure is that we start from uh, neuroprogenitor stem cells. So cells that are stem cells and that they, they are willing to become neurons. What we showed is that if, if we add this combo to our body, I mean, to our neurons, neurons, which are, by the way, again, these are living neurons in a Petri dish. This is not in someone's brain. Here we're showing that the physics are on our side. So if we add this drug, you know, to our neurons and we don't shine light, those neurons will take forever, I mean, to our stem cells. Our stem cells will eventually start to look into neurons, but if we shine the light on it, look at how much more mature, these of the, at the end of the day, think of it as a bunch of cells. Think how here they are already starting to develop into a network of neurons, eventually into what would be a mini cerebral cortex. I know it sounds crazy, and again, there is a lot of biology behind, but the goal of these slides, and later in the questions at the end, because I do have still 30 slides to go through, and I'll go quick, don't worry. I want to show that this is not science fiction. These are measurements. These are measurements in a lab. And yes, it will take a lot for this to be something that everyone has at home, but the, you know, it's happening. Okay, all this is great, and I understand. Some of you think, but these are very high frequencies. Light doesn't propagate that well. Can we go to lower frequencies? Well, remember, we went to optical frequencies not because we wanted. We went to optical frequencies because we wanted to make a small antenna. And when you make a small antenna, you know, Maxwell tells you that your frequency is going to, to, be, to be very high. Fine. So can I go to lower frequencies but still make a small antenna? Well, uh, how could I do that, right? Uh, maybe, maybe, right? We started this talk talking about nanomaterials. So... Can I utilize nanomaterials to make very small antennas, but that you don't need to go to hundreds of terahertz? And the answer is, well, why don't we try to do so? And that's where graphene enters the game. What is graphene? Well, graphene is now a, what, 16 or 17 years old material that has been explored since, again, the 19th century, but it was not until 2004 that Andre Game and Konstantin Novozelov were able to experimentally obtain. This material, at the end of the day, it's a one atom thick material. So you think that paper is thin, right? So no, let's make one atom thick material, which is at the end of the day, carbon. So a bunch of carbon atoms in this honeycomb -like lattice. So think of the tip of your pencil, but you know, graphite, but now make a super thin cut of that, which is only one atom thick. That's graphene. Why do I care about graphene? Well, there are many great properties of it, and people are looking into it as a, to adopt it as a carbon fiber for, for example, aeronautics. People are looking at it for batteries. In our context, we care about graphene because of the properties of graphene plasmonics. What does it mean? Well, it means that those properties that I told you that optical antennas have, even with traditional metals, with graphene, those properties are already true at terahertz frequencies. Terahertz band frequencies are the frequencies between hundreds of gigahertz, so after millimeter wave band, that you know it's very popular these days because of 5G, up to a few terahertz. So we can use graphene, leveraging some of the thoughts and ideas that we had for optical antennas, So, but we can use graphene to make antennas that are super small, uh, and that instead of operating at 100 terahertz, will operate at one terahertz. You will say, oh, Joseph, this is a still a very high frequency. And yes, it is. But the good news is that, well, it's two orders of magnitude less than optical frequencies. That potentially means four orders of uh, magnitude better propagation. How can I take advantage of graphene and this plasmonic property to, for my application? Well, you know, can we use it to make antennas? That's the first question. And the answer is yes. And actually, that's, believe it or not, this is how the entire field of nano-electromagnetic star, uh, networks started with Professor Achildes back in 2000, 2009, when we had the idea of first developing this graphene-based plasmonic nano-antenna. So what's the key idea? Well, the idea is, and again, I know we're almost out of time, so 
the idea was to utilize graphene to leverage the properties of plasmonics, of surface plasma protein wave, to make an antenna, which is going to be one micrometer long, but it's going to operate instead at one terahertz. Fine, we'll talk later if one terahertz is good or bad, but just me, let me just say about technology first. So fine, we have this. What is next? What, what is this terahertz band, right? Well, I'm sure that if you follow the news about, you know, beyond 5G and 6G, you probably have already heard about the terahertz band of one of the key enablers potentially for 6G systems. What is the terahertz band? Well, it's the spectrum after the microwaves and the millimeter wave bands, and, but yet before the infrared. For many years, this spectrum, this band, was, was called the terahertz gap because people didn't know how to generate those signals, how to radiate them, how to efficiently detect those signals. And OK, well, we were not looking for a terahertz technology. We were looking for a nanotechnology. But suddenly, we have a nanotechnology that works at terahertz frequencies. So again, can we use this technology you know, for more things? And that's what we did. So first of all, the antenna is great, but besides the antenna, you need something that can generate the signal, something that can modulate the signal, and then sure, you radiate it out. And then at the receiver, you need the same, something that can detect the signal and the modulate. So for the last 10 years, we have been working on these different blocks. We work into how you can make a tiny device that can go from your nano battery to a terahertz signal on chip, fine, but from nano battery to a terahertz signal, and we had some ideas that combine graphene with three, five semiconductors. So you need both. And we showed that that could work. And actually we got the patent for that. We have been working also on the modulator, how we can add information to that signal, right? I'm a communications person. I need to send signals that carry zeros and ones. So I need a modulator. Of course, the antenna that we have since then built. And of course, these things are very small. And for many applications, well, we would like more power. How could those applications look like? Well, for those applications, you would have to make a race. And the beautiful thing is with nanotechnology, you can make a race literally with thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of elements, because you don't do this array by one student putting one antenna next to the other. These antennas are micrometric in size. You do this through nanofabrication techniques. And honestly, it takes the same effort to make 10, to make a thousand, and to make a million. Of course, the challenge is going to be how to control them, but this is all possible. Again, I'm not trying to say that this is a done deal. It's not trivial by no way. But what I'm trying to say is that physics are on our side and leveraging the physics is what we have been doing. Okay, that means that it's great to use things in the body, but now if suddenly I'm operating at lower frequencies and I can potentially make a race, I can make applications of this technology beyond nano. And beyond nano means that I can leverage this technology, for example, for you know, making a Bluetooth that operates at terahertz frequencies, therefore potentially can communicate at terabits per second. Imagine that, right? Or I could make your Wi-Fi probably, again, we'll need very directional antennas, but we could make your Wi-Fi work at this terabit per second. The reality is that, believe it or not, in collaboration with NASA, we demonstrated three years ago a two kilometer long link carrying multi gigabits per second uh, messages experimentally. And you will say, why did you mention NASA? Well, believe it or not, the key developer of terahertz technology, not through our you know, nano-based approach, but through pushing the limits of the more traditional approach has been NASA, the, the National Aeronautic and Space Agency. And why? Well, they have been developing this technology not for communications. They have been developing this technology because 20, 30 years ago, they realized that around 90% of the energy that comes to the atmosphere uh, from space is actually at terahertz and infrared frequencies heat, right? So since then, they have been developing technology that would allow them to hear to these signals, listen to the signal, interpret those signals. And that's why usually when you think of terahertz, you should go and quickly check what is NASA doing. What's, what, how does this enter the game? Well, we do think that we can use terahertz links also as inter-satellite links, maybe not for up and down links, but through between satellites. And once again, this sounds like crazy, but again, you can, this is public information. NASA has had satellites with terahertz radios in them for more than 10 years now, actually close to 15 years now. So having a terahertz radio in space, it's not new. Using it for communications, well, that's a little bit new, yes.
So there are applications beyond the body, but the final, I mean, the, what I would like to say is that it's not nano or macro, it's actually both, right? And in this vision of the internet of nano things, which again, you think of this today, it makes sense, right? Wearable devices, inside the body devices, devices everywhere, you know, it makes perfect sense today. Now travel 11 years back in time and, you know, look at what we wrote, the internet of nano things. Well, at that point, once again, it requires someone, uh, you know, that has a vision. And, and that's really what happened with Professor Actiel. Fine. Point, there's a question related to that previous slide, which you had displayed there. So yeah. Debashri Basu says that, just out of curiosity, one question he has mentioned, mm -hmm. are there nano devices which can be implemented inside our body to perform certain functions and also can be recharged wirelessly. Is there any such technology available? So that's a very good question. There are many papers and there have been demonstrators. We don't really have, I mean, okay, first of all, okay. So we don't really have some, something that you can buy off the shelves. Uh, probably you're familiar with, you know, uh, Neuralink uh, from Elon Musk. And sure, that's something that you can think of, but that's that's very primitive technology, but that's okay, fine. That, that's the very old fashioned electrical approach. Uh, today, you cannot buy anything like that, but that's a huge research field. And again, people who work on the device size are developing that. So if you're willing to you know, work on this field and for example, start thinking how that interface would look like from the logical, the communications and networking perspective, you can find uh, very good references that you can use to, to convince people that you're not crazy. So again, not commercially, but many research in the lab. And once again, uh, you are not breaking any of the laws of physics. So do not be afraid. It's a matter of time. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, okay. thank you, Dr. Joseph. Yes. I understand. promise I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next part is, okay, we have the devices at terahertz frequencies, uh, but how do terahertz signals propagate, right? Because I... I Many people don't know, but the people who, the few people who have heard something, many times it's not very exciting. They say, oh no, the terahertz band has all this problem with absorption. So, you know, does it make any sense that you use terahertz for communications? And what I would like to say is that, well, at the terahertz band, um, there is indeed absorption. Absorption means that part of your energy is taken by molecules that start vibrating. And remember, you cannot create or destroy energy. You can only convert it from one way to the other. And if your signals are triggering motion, it means that suddenly there is kinetic energy, which means that you lost the energy. So indeed at terahertz frequencies, we have frequencies in which there is absorption. And the key idea is that, well, you don't want to lose at those frequencies like these spikes because your signal will suffer a lot of losses. But look, these are distances of, you know, few meters or even 100 meters. So you want to operate between those spikes, you don't want to be on the absorption peak. You want to be far from the absorption peak, but that's still a lot of bandwidth. That's still hundreds of gigahertz. So if you're smart, you can pick the right frequencies. The problem is that, again, if you're trying to go long distances, you will have to overcome spreading losses or the traditional free space path losses. Before going far in distance, however, remember, we start talking about using this for you know, body applications for which we did tons of, of analysis. So one of the things we did was to compare how do one how does for example a one terahertz signal compare to a you know a orange or red light signal when it comes to propagation inside the body, and what I'm showing here is you know the path loss in dB and this is on the left is for one terahertz on the right is for orange line and you know you see this and you say ah I, I see that terahertz can go in the body but you know it's two orders of magnitude less frequency but the path loss it, it's almost the same and that's how i fool you because look at the x-axis the figure on the left it's millimeter the figure on the right is micrometer so we can increase the communication range of even an intra-body device by three orders of magnitude by moving from optics to terahertz frequencies. Of course, this is taking into account the absorption, the spreading, the scattering, all those things that we have plenty of model papers to do that. So that's something that you know we are showing. Does this mean that the entire medical community needs to drop microscopy and start talking about terahertz? No, that we're not saying that. We're saying that at terahertz frequencies, again, 
People from communications are afraid of going up in frequency. People who are actual the users of, you know, or the designers of the intra-body systems, the biological people are at even higher frequencies. What we're saying is that there is an opportunity for terahertz radiation to help. Before everyone starts panicking, terahertz radiation, again, some people are, oh, it's high frequency. Well, it's high frequency, but it's less than optical. So no, it is not ionizing. Terahertz radiation cannot break up molecules. Terahertz radiation cannot break up cells just because it has less energy than your infrared and optical signals. There is one thing, however, that you need to take into account, which is, yes, the absorption of terahertz radiation means that molecules will try to move. But if molecules are in a solid or in a liquid, they try to move, but they are not free to move. The result is that there is friction. And if there is friction, what happens when there is friction? When there is friction, there is heat. So terahertz radiation can be used for, you know, can generate heat. Like any other form of radiation, by the way, again, do not panic. That's how you heat your, your water or your milk in your microwave oven, right? And that's at 2.3 gigahertz and no one panics. Well, why? Because in a microwave oven, you have a thousand watts of power. With my nano radios, I may have a few micro watts of power and I will be very happy already. So just giving some, some sense of the numbers. Of course, if we want to go for the long range, right? If we want to go for the not nano applications, we'll need very high gain directional antennas. And you know, the nice thing is that at terahertz frequencies, even a high gain antenna, like with 20, 30, 40, even 50 dB, it's going to be small. And these are some of the antennas that we have in the lab that we use for different of the non nano experiments. But we think that there are better things to do. Like for example, we can, as we said before, we can leverage this massive antenna rays, and we don't even call it MIMO or massive MIMO, we call it ultra massive MIMO, and we also got the patent for this, which is leverage the physics of plasmons to make antenna rays with a control far from what you can have today. And we can use those arrays in different ways. We need to design, first of all, the structure. Printing antennas is simple. Integrating and controlling them, not so much, right? So we have some ideas on how these things need to be controlled and the performance that they could achieve. And we know that today it's very fancy, very popular to talk about not just transmission and reception, but also reflection of signals, for example, through intelligent reflecting surfaces. We have worked on that too. Actually, we were working on this four years ago, not because we wanted to have intelligent reflecting surfaces, but because that was the easier thing to design. It's much easier to design a structure in reflection than a transmitting or reflecting structure, fine. And of course, the ultimate vision is that we use this in combination. We want to control propagation of the transmitter through the walls, walls that can be helping with your signal, but can also be sensing. Remember, do not forget, we started talking about nano sensing, and then of course, at the receiver. Many things need to happen, right? And the technology is there. The communications and signal processing is what comes next. And for that, again, our group, we have done many works, both from the nano perspective and the macro perspective. From the nano perspective, we push for the development of pulse-based modulation schemes because these pulses are very simple to be generated at the nano scale, so we can use them for short range intra-body or out of the body communications, but also new ideas for the long range, and I'll go through quickly with this, in which we take actually, instead of going away from the absorption, we try to take advantage of the absorption as a way to spatially multiplex users. So for the macro scale, fun. Uh, we also show that when you have this big bandwidth, many times you may not need it for the data rate, but you can instead design spread spectrum systems, systems that are very secure, that only if you know the code you can recover, that can coexist with narrow band users that, that are great. And actually at terahertz frequencies, you have so much bandwidth that you can spread your signal power really low and still work. And again, we did different experiments and we actually showed that fine. I'm coming to an end and I wanted to say, look, we are at a point in which we have many results on the physics side and on the physical layer side, and it's time to build the networks. Networks that you know uh, will have some unique functionalities. And for example, when you deal with devices which have such large bandwidth, right? Medium access control, you will think it's simple. Well, it's simple. The only challenge is that, yes, there is bandwidth for everyone, but we all have little power, 
We may not have many energy if we are nano. And if we are macro, we will be using directional antennas. So we don't know what each other is. So synchronization becomes the bottleneck at the link layer. We have some ideas actually in this paper that was accepted in 2019, but it came out finally last month, um, in which we show both nano and macro cases of terahertz medium access control. In this case, in which instead of having the transmitter leaving everything, it's the receiver. Similarly with routing, right? So think in the following way. If you are nano and you're trying to help someone else who is nano too, you have very limited memory. You have, you're busy not handling your messages. How are you also going to handle someone else's messages, right? So that becomes a problem. Or if you're macro, you will say, oh, you have tons of resources. Yeah, but remember at the macro scale, you would move to the terahertz band because you have this huge bandwidth. You can talk very fast, but if you talk very fast, uh, well, then your memory is going to be very full very full, I mean, very quickly it's going to be full. So, well, maybe we need to change. And instead of, you know, receiving a message, storing it, looking for it, and then finding the route and sending over, maybe what we want to do is, well, receiving a message, uh, can I handle it? Yes or not? Moving on, give it back. Think of it as kind of hot potato routing. And of course, to make all these decisions at the link layer, at the network layer, or even above, things like machine learning will come in pretty handy. I mentioned many times that we did experiments and we must thank the National Science Foundation who funded, I would say the majority of this equipment or 70% of this equipment. The rest comes from the Air Force Research Lab and we're very thankful. This is an experimental platform, not only for nano, actually it's very well suited for long. With this platform, we did some of those like two kilometer long link. And as anything else, like in the US, we, when we work with the National Science Foundation, we are all open and willing to collaborate. So if someone is into maybe, you know, physical layer design or things like that for terahertz, we're happy to, to give you access and to send signals for you and explore ideas together. And just to wrap up, look, thinking in the wireless community for the last, you know, I mean, from the very beginning, you know, wireless communication has been mostly to connect us in the physical world to the digital world in real time, right? That's how we have been evolving through all the IoTs and fine. What we're showing is that, you know, the future of communications is to go just this physical digital interface, but create a real time biological digital interface. And the talk that you have heard today, it's trying to build the foundations for that real time interface between biological and digital, but also biological and physical, we are really trying to close this loop. With this, uh, I stopped talking. Now I'm ready for more questions, if any. And of course, uh, as you can imagine, all this work is not a one-man effort. This is done with a large team of people. And, and uh, there is always room in the lab for good students. I always say that. You will never see in our website that we're recruiting, we're hiring. No, we, you know, People who find us out are the people that I, that, that I care, right? I don't need to push out. I, I like when people reach out, say, we really would like to work and we come and we do something. And look, you know, we, we have a lot that is probably too big right now, but thanks to all of them, because this is how this, this work can be done. With that, Manjula, the, yes, back to professor. you. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, just before concluding, I would like to know any of, if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, I think the, somewhere during the session, Somya, did you raise your hand? If so, I will allow you to talk. Uh, let me just, I'm giving you permission, Somya. If you have any doubt, you can ask. Uh -oh. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, maybe there's a question. Let me try to take that question. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, Professor Joseph, uh, still there's a question. A uh, candidate would like to know about uh, how Moore's law is related to this nanotechnology or something. Uh, maybe I, the question is not clear. I think better I will uh, try to put it. Yeah. Uh, Gitanjali, just check if you can unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, don't be shy, please. I mean. <laughs> no, I think we have to give permissions here. Okay. Uh, Gitanjali. Yeah, you can unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, ma'am, I'm audible to you. Yes, yes, Gitanjali. Yeah. yeah. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. With respect to electronic devices, when we are speaking, uh, there will be consideration with respect to your Morse law, right, sir? Is there any relationship with respect to your Morse law on these biological signals as they are interfaced, right? 
again, that, that's a very good question. So, okay, when we think of the, of the Moore's law, we think of the scaling law for computing devices, right? And at the end of the day, it all comes to down how, how traditional computers work, right? Which at the end of the day, you will have a chip, which is nothing but a bunch of transistors. And Moore, Moore's law tells you, you know, how, how small you can make transistors and how many of them you can put together. And of course, people have been saying for many years that the Moore's law is not going to continue, but for some reason, it's still, you know, it's still applying. And that's, that's very exciting. When it comes to the biological side, we don't really have a law like that in the sense that it's not that we're trying to make things smaller. Actually, on the biology side, things are already small. So I would, I would take your question in two ways. On the one hand is, do we have a Moore's law on the biology side? And, and I'm afraid there is no such thing. But the other way that we can put the question is, can the biology help us to continue on the trend of the Moore's law for longer time? And you may have seen that there are many groups working on the concept of, for example, molecular computing, uh, molecular computing or DNA-based computing. I mentioned, right? So at the end of the day, we, I mean, we think of us as an individual, but we are nothing but a network of, of cells, right? Many, many, many cells. Each cell has its own computer and that computer in its cell is nothing but DNA. So there are people working into, you know, trying to leverage, uh, you know, what, what DNA as a computer can do. One thing, however, that we need to think is that generally the speed at which computations happen in a biological system like our body, it's much, much, much slower than the speed at which your transistor can switch. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. But still, right, if I, my body is doing, you know, literally thousands or, or more functions in parallel. So when we think of molecular or DNA computer, the power mostly comes from the ability of parallelization, being able to do multiple things at the same time in a network that is perfectly coordinated. Once again, I touch my finger here, I immediately know that I'm touching here, right? That it's real time while I'm breathing, while I'm seeing, while I'm talking, while I'm listening. So I, that's a good question. That's a good comment. I have not seen a Moore law for biology. Uh, if you ask me, do I think that biology can help continue the trend of the Moore law? Uh, probably yes. We may not know just yet how, but within the realm of this non-traditional computing, I clearly think that biology has an edge. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the ultimate goal. And I say what I said at the beginning, biology is great, but it's not necessary. I don't want to think that that's the best we can do. Maybe I'm too naive or too ambition. I think that hybrid solutions could be better. Maybe that's another topic, you know. Uh, well, that's what we're trying to do at the end, interfacing electronics with the brain. So maybe, we'll see. Good question, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Joseph. Uh, so there's one more, one question. Uh, maybe I'll just try to ask him. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hanmantra sir, if you can uh, just ask this question on yourself, that's okay. Otherwise, I'll read your question on your behalf. Yeah, okay, fine. I think he, he said uh, he's uh, uh, on the mobile. Uh, will there be any effect on human nervous system at terahertz operating electronic devices? Sorry, I lost you for one second. Can you repeat? Yeah, fine. Uh, will there be any effect on human nervous system at terahertz operating electronic devices? Okay, let's think. I mean, that's a very good question too. So first of all, so we were saying, right, right? We, we showed that in, in the previous slide that at terahertz frequencies, well, it's electromagnetic radiation, fine. It's electromagnetic radiation that it's, at some frequencies, it is absorbed uh, by water. And, and yeah, we do have water in our body, right? We're most liquids actually. So there is, interaction between terahertz radiation and cells in our body. Fine. This, you know, as a, com as a communications person, I would say, oh, well, then that is bad, right? Well, uh, I, I remember very well the conversation with Michal, uh, Michal Stachowiak, Professor Stachowiak at Buffalo, who said, Joseph, you're always talking about terahertz. Uh, with me, you do optical. With him, we do the red light, the blue light, but you're always talking about terahertz. Uh, what, what is all about? Say, well, terahertz is great, but you know, there is this absorption by water. So I don't know if we want to put this in the body. And he's like, why not? I mean, look, if there is absorption, it means that there is a mechanism to transfer energy from electromagnetic signal to absorption, maybe to heat. 
which means that there is a potential way to interface terahertz signals with biology. So do not think that having absorption is bad. If there were no absorption, there would be no way in which you could interface with neurons. So that's the first step. Of course, is this interface something that we can leverage or is it we, and we can control? Is it a one-way interface? We create something on the cell or can the cell send something back? And that's something that we started exploring, uh, but the results are too early to share, but let's put it in the following way. There are a few, I mean, first of all, there are some very old papers and I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago, talking about that in neurons, there, some people have predicted some resonances of different structures and those resonances looked to be at terahertz frequencies. So, you know, is there actually a wireless interface in neurons between them that we didn't know and happens to be at terahertz frequencies? Again, those are papers that had, were a little bit polemic and that's fine. We will not marry too much to them, but there are several works coming out these days that they look into that relation between terahertz and different type of neurons or different type of cells, sorry. Uh, at the very least, through absorption, you can generate heat. And if you go crazy with the heat, you can think of this as, for example, radiotherapy. Uh, but again, that's if you go crazy with the heat. We want to explore if we can use terahertz radiation to do anything on the neurons and vice versa. And the first step is there. Yes, we can, because there is absorption. How to do more? Well, that, that's research. We don't have the answer today. It's certainly something we're looking at, but I don't want to say something that maybe in one year we say, no, that's not true. But it's a very good question and it's something that, yeah, we are looking and some groups are looking. Okay, thank you, Professor. Any other questions from the audience side? The students who are from SRM AP, you need not hesitate. And those who are planning to do the, your research work in this domain, if you have any queries, you can ask. This is the best opportunity for you all to interact. Yeah, don't yeah, be shy. And, and, yeah, and, you and, can and, just unmute yourself. You need not even type the questions because they're only like, uh, I felt uh, I'll give you direct permissions. I have unmuted yourself. Please unmute yourself and you can ask. Prashant, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, ma'am. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Prashant. Sir, yes, go ahead, Prashant. Sir, namaste. Sir, uh, <laughs> I want to ask, as a uh, young researcher, in the uh, beginning stage, how we need to start in the okay. uh, nano terahertz? Sir? Something okay. which, will, which will be helpful uh, labs either through an online or any more so that we can start working from here, from India. Okay, very good question. So the first thing is the following. The good news is that today there are papers on this field. So as in any other research field, you need to do a literature search. Uh, when we started working with this with Professor Achilles again in 2009, and um, well, there were no papers talking about electromagnetic nano networks and all these things. There were a few papers from him on talking on the molecular case. So we had to spend a long time going through papers on physics and paper on material science. And even if I'm a wireless communications person, some of the courses I took at the PhD level when I was a student were not comms. I, I already had taken all those. So I was taking courses on quantum mechanics, fine. Do you need to do that today? Well, do not be afraid. The good news is that if I have done my job properly, you don't need to go back to the foundations of physics to, to do this. Today, you can start from some of these works that we have been doing. And by we, I don't mean just me, I mean the community that has been growing in the last uh, several years. And you can start from those. And for example, right? I think it's always interesting to see the evolution of things. So you probably, okay. Think in the following way. Imagine that 20 years ago, or uh, uh, imagine that today you discover something. Then 10 years from now, someone says, oh, 10 years ago, someone discovered this. Fine. When 20 years from now, someone reads the paper, you don't want that person to just read what someone said that someone said 10 years ago, right? You don't stop into uh, 10 years back. You need to go to the origin. So I'm asking you first, to understand what happened, I would ask you, go and read the very first paper on nano networks from Professor Achilles in 2008. Then read the one in 2010, in which we throw in the electromagnetics. The one in 2011, in which we actually compare the two. And that will give you a picture of how all these things started. Fine. Then you will have to pick whether you want to go onto the molecular track or the electromagnetic track. But then what I would say is, look at what has been published 
if it's on molecular track, look at the works of, of course, Professor Achilles, but eventually, you know, he moves to the next topic very quickly, but look at what he has, but also what Massimiliano Pirovon has been publishing. Uh, look at our colleagues in Finland, Sassi Saran, Balasso Gramanian. Well, he used to be in Finland, now he's in Ireland. Fine, that's fine. Look at the works that come out from our lab, and then you will see that the community of nanonetworking is not necessarily too big. So what I would do is, you look, for some of these papers, you look, when you run a search, there are two things to do. You can do a, a topic search, right? And you put nano networks on Google Scholar and you could come up with many things, fine. As important as that, look at the authors that always show up, click on that author name and look what they are uh, doing and you will see what's happening right now. For the papers that we did last year to be the top papers in the field, it, it takes some time, right? And if you just run a topic search, you will get tired because you will start only looking by the old papers. You need to look at the old papers that provide the foundation, but then you need to look what's happening today and you should build your work with today's assumptions, not the assumptions that we have to make 10 years ago. Um, what else I, I wanted to say? Well, that's, I would say that, that that's the thing. The field has changed a lot in 10 years. That doesn't mean that you should not read the papers from 10 years ago, read them. But then do not stop with the ideas of 10 years ago. Look at what's happening today. And from them on, you move. I think, again, if as a community we have done our job properly, even if you are far from physics or more onto the comms and the networking, we should have answered your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Any other questions from the audience? Fine. Professor, there's one question from my side. How about uh, security and privacy aspects uh, with respect to these nano devices? Come, let it be a physical security part or the uh, security related to communications and networking. Uh, because I don't find point. much, I don't find much work here because as you have also said that networking layer is the just gradually started or maybe a one or two years ago it started. Yeah, there's yeah. much to go from a network layer to transport layer and then application. So I was thinking about a security aspect. <laughs> okay, that, that's a very good question too. So the idea is the following. Um, by the way, there were some very early papers on the security of nano networks back in 2011 or 12. I don't remember the author, but I remember the paper. So you may find something, but again, all these things have changed a lot in 10 years, right? So first of all, is it important? Well, in many cases, we're talking about controlling your genome. So yes, you want to protect that, right? <laughs> you don't want anyone to induce you who knows what. Or even if you're just sensing, right? You're sensing medical data. You don't want to anyone to hack your signals and, and know that actually you have cancer or something like that, right? Fine. So how do we do all that? Well, as always, you need... I mean, in our group, we always come from the bottom up, right? So. Let's think, what is in terms of physical layer security? Well, you're dealing with signals that are super weak, that are at high frequency, that are potentially very short in time because you can potentially communicate very fast. So, well, you would think that from the physics perspective, you might be fine. Of course, you need to think that if someone is going to hack your system, it's probably going to be through a similar technology. So, you know, it's going to be also with a device that is a small, that might be around, right? Um, so you may want to think that from the, you know, it's going to be very different whether you're trying to protect the, tech, the devices that you have in your body or the signals that go outside your body or the signals that are not in a body, a body type of a, a scenario. From the physics perspective, as I said, when you are nano, you're small, you're low power, you're low complexity, forget about implementing encryption or anything like that, okay? Uh, but let's try to leverage that you don't have much power and that you are very high frequency and potentially you're very fast to try to minimize the opportunity for anyone to intercept you. But an analysis could be, could be interesting. When you go outside the body and you go to the macro size application of these frequencies, well, we did have some work on physical layer security, um, for example, of terahertz signals. And the key idea is the following. You're dealing with, again, signals which are very short in time. So you need to be able to intercept them at the right moment. But OK, imagine that you have a continuous listening device. But then they are also very directional, right? So you need to be at the right place, right? You, if you have a transmitter that is directional, a receiver that is directional, you need to really be at the right, uh, at the right point. Uh, well, that's hard. 
We did show, uh, we have another slide, I forgot to add that, but we, we do have a paper in Nature in which we actually experimentally show, this is a collaboration with Professor Dan Mittelman and Professor Edward Knightley, in which we showed that we can, uh, look, when you go to high frequencies, your wavelength becomes very small. So even a very small device can intercept your signal. And for example, a, a paper clip can generate a diffracted copy of your signal and, inter and create a copy of your signal somewhere else. So you're very directional, that's fine. But if, if someone knows where your beam is, a tiny metallic piece of anything you can think of, like a, a paper clip, could be enough to diffract part of the energy and you being able to eavesdrop. So there are something. Again, this is true at any frequency. At optical frequencies, it's the same. At lower frequencies, it's even worse. So again, uh, this is something that happens. But those are the very few works when it comes to the security of not only nano, but terahertz. Uh, there is not much. I mean, there is. it's a field that you want to understand. My, my take is always the same. Let's see if, I mean, instead of trying to redo what has been done, let's see if you can find anything on the physics side or based on the physics that can help you secure your network. Right? That's, that's where the novelty can come. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. So if there's a, uh, time for us, I would like to take up last question. Is it okay, Professor? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, it's again from uh, 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 Professor Hanmanta Rao. Uh, this question is, what are the immediate application areas in near future? How much time it takes to get fully developed in near future? That's a very good question. It all depends on what we're targeting. I mean, and I would say today we have seen two sets of applications of nanotechnologies and related to optics and terahertz. One is really the nanomedical side of the story. The other is the outside of the body, larger scale type of communications. For the nanomedical side of the story, well, first of all, we're much better than 10 years ago, but we are still a little bit far to be able to have these devices in a commercial stage. I can tell you that, for example, the, the project on the wearable and intra-body devices for uh, cancer monitoring, that's a con project with industry. And as you can imagine, industry is always asking for real time results uh, as much as possible. So we are at the point that, uh, you know, if you have to ask me, if you ask me to put a number on, on somewhere, I would say in five years, it makes sense that we have some early, you know, for example, in the US would be FDA early disclosures on how you could have that wearable device working. So we are at the point that we are doing testing of the wearable and implantable devices with uh, living tissues. That's the first step. So you go from living tissues then you're going to need to go to living humans, but the technology is ready. The sensors are ready. The wearable device with the optics uh, are, is ready. The challenge is again, making the device reliable because we're dealing with medical uh, capabilities. So you need to be reliable. If not, you'll never be approved. You need to be reliable and you need to make it resilient, right? At the end of the day, your body is going to attack anything that it doesn't know. So we need to code, we need to, to make your device bio-friendly. And that's where the challenge is. But I would say, you know, five years doesn't sound crazy and hopefully it's even less than that. For the non-nano applications, for the more macro, again, based on nanotechnologies, but more macro applications of terahertz, well, this is happening around the corner. I mean, we are working with industry names that, well, I cannot disclose, but, you know, companies that you all know, and this is going to happen sooner than that. So, as I said, people have just started to talk about 6G and maybe 6G adopting frequencies above 100 gigahertz, so you start to get into the terahertz band. Um, the reality is that, you know, big companies are working on systems at 120 to 140 gigahertz, so just the very, very beginning. You can think of that not only on the cellular star, but if you think more of a Wi-Fi networks, there is even a standard for terahertz communications around 300 gigahertz, a standard that was approved in 2017, for which, unfortunately, there are no devices, but the industry, different industries are working on chipsets for that, and that's 300 gigahertz. Those are not going to be really nano, but they are already on terahertz. So there's still plenty of work, but some of the early products on that side could come as early as soon as three years. But that's what we're talking about. And all this is very fluid in the sense that all the deadlines move up and down and things may happen tomorrow or maybe in five years. But from the moment that industry is interested is when you really see the big dollars. 
And then it's when things start to, to happen in a more applied commercial uh, stage. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think that now we have come to a closing session. So before I close, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jornet for giving us this uh, wonderful lecture. So most of us are still thinking that uh, this is just like a sci-fi fiction, uh, what Professor uh, Feynman had uh, told in one of his lecture. So people were just thinking it's a science fiction story. Now, 50 years down the time, we have invented graphene. And from there, still we were thinking it's a hypothetical. And from there, around uh, approximately eight to 10 years, uh, we have come up with some of the uh, models. And as a professor said, I don't think so. It is too far for us to have these amidst us. Uh, so professor, once again, I thank you for accepting our invitation and giving such a wonderful talk. And similarly, I try to thank our management, our department head, our department uh, colleagues and faculties who have helped, uh, made this possible. Uh, spe uh, special thank even to the audience. And last but not the least, I just tell people who are into sciences, dream, though it is a science fiction, people will laugh at you, they try to stop you. Don't, do, uh, don't stop at that point. And one point that you will realize that it is possible, maybe five years or 10 years or whatever it is, it will be uh, realizable. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Professor Joseph. I will get Thank back you. to you through uh, on the via emails and all. Thank you. I look forward to those. Thank you again for the opportunity and for running this event so smoothly. And again, I do look forward to emails and I do look forward to, to working with some of you. Thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you.